Great. So I think we'll make a start to this evening's program. Um, I'm so sorry that I'm going to be making the introduction with my back to you, but I hope uh, you feel welcomed nonetheless. There's more questions now, so maybe you can answer some of them. So to... To welcome our um, online viewers, uh, both tonight and in future viewings, uh, for example, on our YouTube site, uh, you're being welcomed to Kunst Institute Melli and this evening to a rather special gathering here in 84 Steps, which is an ongoing exhibition and to some extent experiment with exhibition as a clinic uh, that foregrounds mental health, feminism and how spaces care for or create uh, tensions and dissonances. And we're specifically in a installation by Afra Eisma, who is a alumni of the Royal Academy of Arts, the Kaibe Ka in Den Haag. And we're joined by uh, tonight's co-presenting uh, partners, the Master of Fine Arts uh, of Artistic Research. And we have students here with us, as well as the uh, course director, Janice McNabb, uh, also in the room, we have two of the artists from 84 Steps, Domenico Mangano and Marika Van Roy. I'm not sure if you wave your hands in the background if that'll pick up. <laughs> we also have here okay. in the room with us our institutional director and uh, really the lead visionary and curator of 84 Steps, uh, Sophia hernandez Chongqui, uh, who is waving in the other direction to the students. Uh, we also have Pilar Mata Dupont and Julia Mokchu, um, assistant curators and project managers here as well on a very busy Friday program. We've had a number of uh, academic partners come through. We've had a number of performances taking place, including by Mangana Van Roy, as well as with Joy Mariama Smith in the space this evening. And we're delighted to end this active day with a keynote program with a very special guest and a very significant one for 84 Steps, Lisa Apignanesi. Uh, Lisa is joining us virtually from London this evening. She is a prize winning writer, novelist and cultural commentator. Until 2020, she was the chair of the Royal Society of Literature, which she is now a vice president. And she's a former chair of the Freud Museum in London. This is uh, just one of her books, uh, Everyday Madness, which we're currently selling uh, in our bookshop downstairs. And I believe that another book, Mad, Bad and Sad, A History of Women and the Mind Doctors from 1800 is uh, sold out because it's been such an important book in framing some of the studies of 84 Steps. So in a bit of a unique structure tonight, uh, the keynote will be in the form of a conversation in order to really tease out some of the threads of Lisa's work uh, specific to ongoing research. Um, and for that, we're very delighted to have moderating Vivian Sky Rayberg. Uh, Vivian is senior research lecturer at the Willem de Kooning Academy. Uh, she's a longstanding friend of Kunst Institute Melli in its various guises over the past three years. And her current research really delves into art and psyche, including the psychology of aesthetics and aesthetic experience, uh, aesthetic emotions and emotional labor, how emotions are normalized, socialized, shared, inhabited, or communicated within communities of practice. So really um, relevant and exciting research threads. This evening, we'll have a certain interest in a, in a keyword of attention, attention as a, a tool within psychoanalysis, as well as attention uh, within economies of distraction and attention um, mediatically, which have been so dramatized under the pandemic, but also the forms of sensory attentiveness uh, that art often calls us to. So as a frontispiece to this program, we'll be starting with a short eight minute film. It's a, a portrait in some regards, as well as an essay written by Apignanese uh, upon invitation of the CCB, the Center for Contemporary Culture Barcelona, as part of their program of vocabulary for the future. So uh, we offer thanks in screening this. The piece is directed by uh, Neos Ballas and it's titled Cura. So excuse me for a minute as we trigger uh, the playback. Uh, this might take a minute.
the English word cat to look after. This show root is a Latin paradise. Yeah. And was cousin to be a coward, guy. Yeah, guy, bound and guy, too. All the sex care belonged, it seemed to me, in that bright bit of the world garden with the affections fly. Mothers could go there to nurse their babies, partners to cherish each other, or roses. Through the generations, centuries, such caring emotions have become linked with the feminine. In the Excuse me, I'm going to have to um, interrupt because um, I'm very sorry, but uh, neither Lisa nor I see the video in the Zoom. And so I'm curious to know if um, our external audience sees the video. But we're a, a special external audience. Oh, no. yeah. So according to um, our external guests, remote guests, they don't, the Zoom attendees don't see the video. There we go. Is it better? Yeah, you no, know, it just needs to be rewound and it's fine. Uh, Thank thanks you, Vivian, I'm sorry. <laughs> We all carry a slippery, wildly associative etymological dictionary within ourselves. In mine, the English word care, to look after, used to share a root with the Latin caritas, or charitable, and was cousin to the Italian caro, dear, darling, valued and valuable, too. All these senses of care belonged, it seemed to me, in that bright bit of the word garden where the affections thrive. Mothers could go there to nurse their babies, partners to cherish each other, or the roses. Through the generations and centuries, such caring emotions have become linked with the feminine in the feminist 1970s and 80s, they were constituted as women's work. Women performed the emotional labor in the family, cared for partners, babies, children, and ailing aged parents. All of this, of course, unpaid, or if paid to caring domestic health, then paid very badly. When care was nudged in Britain and in much of Europe, at first into the welfare economy and later into the privatized or the public-private care economy, which juggled the making of money with a meeting of needs, the people who carried out the labor of care, the carers, nurses, elder home workers, child minders, even teachers, joined the ranks of the low paid. During the long months of the COVID plague, the people we now call care professionals emerged as the great heroes of our historical moment. Masked and protectively covered on our screens, it nonetheless became blatantly clear that these brave soldiers in the front line of the battle against the killer virus were, in large proportion, immigrants and from ethnic minorities. Despite the care they lavishly and tirelessly showered on their patients, they remained amongst the lowest paid and most endangered in our society. When I went to research the word care, it turned out to have its origins in Old English and Proto-German, not in Latin at all. Its first meanings were all to do with grief, with sorrow, 
and lamentation. Later, these meanings migrated to worry and concern. Crucially, attention appeared in these acquisitions of meaning. To care was to pay attention. Attention, if you pause to think, is not really all that far from love. What is it to hold someone dear but to be attentive to them, to focus on their needs and wants, to pay them attention? Why did all those women characters and stories of old fall in love with seductive men? Except that seduction meant paying a kind of concentrated attention the woman rarely received elsewhere. These days, we live, we are told, in an attention economy. Attention is in short supply in our speedy, global, networked world, packed with facts and data and information of various kinds, some reliable, much not at all. Being scarce, attention is a valuable commodity. Everyone competes for our attention. Producers, branders, marketers, politicians, the backers behind them with their ready capital. Meanwhile, our children, though we prefer not to think that the problem is ours and our times, readily obtain damning medical diagnoses of attention deficit, a disorder that prevents them from paying the attention that their elders will invest amply in stealing away, but perhaps don't have the time to care enough to give freely. On the other hand, if caring is paying attention, being attentive to those who need it, shouldn't the attention economy be learning from the care sector? Those who work in care, a majority of them women, have an abundance of a desirable and rare commodity. They are attentive beyond the capabilities of the rest of us. We should make them society's professors and remunerate their care accordingly. So uh, without further ado, Vivian, I'd love to hand it to you to lead off the conversation. Thanks, Vivian. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, hi, Janice and the artists uh, enrolled in the Master Artistic Research at the KABK. It's great um, to have you in the room. I have no idea why that's happening. Enrolled in the Master Artistic Research at the KABK. It's great um, to have you in the room. And um, thank you, uh, Lisa, for agreeing to have this conversation today. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you also for inviting me, uh, Kunst Institute Mali, to participate in this conversation with Lisa. Um, Maybe it would be good to talk a little bit just in the first instance about your um, this production of the video with uh, Neus Ballas, um, how you came to be involved in the project and um, yeah, what your role was in general in the, in the making of the work as a whole. Well, the Center for Contemporary Culture in Barcelona, uh, some of you may know is a vast um, 
Art Center, which does multimedia um, as well as ideas and visual exhibitions. Um, it also does performance. So, so it, you know, it incorporates all the arts. And um, the director and I had worked before on various projects. And she said to me that they were developing this idea for a vocabulary of the future, um, particularly important under plague conditions, under COVID conditions, where so many of us were in lockdown. And um, she invited me to contribute a word of my choice to this vocabulary for the future. And of course, given the, the situation that we were in, the people who were most um, in my mind or a great deal in my mind at the time were indeed care workers. And, you know, they're, it's, it's a tricky word in English, care, because it's both a soft and lovely word, but it's also a word that has come to um, be associated with all kinds of uh, difficult things death, um, a particular kind of um, work which engages people from all over the world to work cheaply, um, which taxes the conscience all the time and did so well before plague. Sorry, I call COVID plague. <laughs> um, and so I thought I would try and dismantle this thing because the word care for me personally had also been a very um, good word not a word that entered into the political arena. And I had, as I say in the film, um, linked it to um, dear and affection um, and not only to affliction and death. Um, the other word, by the way, that it is linked to, and I didn't put that into the film because it got too complicated, is the word cure. And of course, if we're going to be talking about uh, psychiatry and psychoanalysis, that word too needs to be put within brackets. So what happened with the CCCV is I wrote a text and I would, was then asked to record this text. And as you can see, the recording is not of the first quality, but then this extraordinary director and filmmaker, um, uh, Nois Balous, uh, put it together and I think in a wonderful way because it created uh, an atmosphere of great stateliness and moment around something which we've been seeing on our television screens as a site of frenzied activity and, and uh, a great deal of a different kind of concern and worry. And I, th I thought that she made the film extremely beautiful as well as um, poignant and meaningful. And of course, she also teases out all the feminine sides and if you like feminist sides within that, which is to do with the mother-child relationship and so on, because the mother-child, of course, is another uh, paradigm of care and caring. Um, maybe we can then take a moment to sort of contextualize um, this word care and, and this film uh, and text work in relationship to, to uh, Mad, Bad and Sad, um, your 2008 book, which is really a tome, I have to say. It's um, some 600 pages, um, spans two centuries, and um, engages with um, the, the history of mental health and illness, the treatment of the mind, the emotions, um, your longstanding engagement with questions of the psyche, which you've written about in both fiction and nonfiction, I should say. Um, in preparation for the conversation, I returned to uh, Mad, Bad and Sad, and um, was thinking about how the Western legal, social and cultural contexts and formations in Europe and the US um, were uh, really explicated alongside the development of an understanding of how the mind works and how the mind can fail to work according to uh, those norms and expectations. And besides the book's remarkable accessibility and readability, what struck me in dipping back into it was the, um, the way in which all of the case studies, because the book is organized around case studies of women who were um, deemed mentally ill and played a role in the development of diagnosis, diagnoses of mental illness. Um, what, what struck me was how those case studies so sensitively accrued to provide women with um, agency, even those who were 
punished, exploited, criminalized, locked up. Um, we, we get a sense of what female agency is across this, um, across this span of history and within this sort of uh, uh, medical psychosocial context. And these women were agents um, as patients, as family members, doctors and analysts, creative interpreters of their own psychosocial experiences and behaviors. So um, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the, the link between um, your book ends uh, in, uh, in, the, in the late 20th century and then uh, talk about this sort of, sort of shift to the language of care in the early 21st century uh, with respect to that development. Does that make sense as a question? Well, it's a long it's, question. It's a long question. Um, yeah. I mean- I, A long I, setup. Uh, yes, I think a beautiful setup, but I think one of the, um, am I clear by the way, because one of my ears seems to have gone, okay. Um, the, the, the whole concept of care is of course part of the setting up of what we would now call the mental health professions. Um, um, they, became, they became psychiatry, but they weren't that to start with. Um, it was really a, a set of, of medical and caring expertises, looking after, guarding, um, in the worst cases, expertises that grew up with the uh, beginning of the asylums in the early 19th century. Uh, as soon as um, the emotional and mental um, state of people went out of the um, area of religion. In other words, it was neither any longer a question of possession or a question of punishment. Um, although both of those, you know, Things never stop altogether in history. They carry on. I mean, there, there is a way in which things uh, recur and carry on in different ways. So care was the reason that the asylums were set up. And the word asylum itself, of course, is meant to be a place where people are cared for uh, while they can no longer care for themselves. Um, the fact that those asylums, and that is part, you know, the whole notion of attention comes into this as well, um, were also uh, disciplinary structures and sometimes coercive structures, quite often as you move towards the 20th century, increasingly uh, coercive and penitential um, areas where, where patients were not only uh, regimented, but also uh, experimented on, um, you know, optimistically, one would like to think that the doctors had good intentions, but sometimes that wasn't altogether clear. Um, but in any case, so, so th there's a kind of negative side always to care, which can be, I, I tend to be psychoanalytic in my understanding and my readings, because I grow out of literature. And um, there's always a double emphasis to all words and both attention and care have this other side, this side of coerciveness and discipline that comes alongside them. So in, in terms of the people who were cared for in the institutions and the people who did go either into the penitential system because a lot of them, or some of them at least committed crimes and, and were punished for them if they were not thought to be altogether mad i.e. without mind, um, uh, without responsibility for their mind. Um, some of them were cared for and the caring was often something which felt quite harsh and had an aura of discipline, but because it meant that after the, the condition or the state of mania in which which is a shorthand for breakdown, or breakdown is a shorthand for a great many things that happen to people when they are no longer in some kind of attunement with their emotions or their mental faculties. In other words, reality disappears. After the initial uh, uh, moment of discipline, a lot of these institutions, at least originally, were caring for patients. And they cared for them by attending to their needs and attempting to stop them from being distracted. Um, because it was also thought one of the ways of understanding certain kinds of madness was that, um, and this has not changed all that much, although the language around it has changed, was that people's minds go into um, uh, 
vicious circles. They cannot get away from things. In other words, they become obsessional or they become manic and have manias um, which won't leave them alone. Um, something is in control of them which doesn't allow them to focus in any way on the reality around them. Um, we talk about mental disorders, but often these are emotional as well as mental states, ment uh, emotional disorders. And caring can have a rough face to it. So um, the initial way of tending to mania was to give people hot and cold baths, say, um, to, to keep them from harming themselves, and then to apply a regularity to their days and ways. And the best side of asylum life was often that there was this regularity and people were allowed to, I don't know, say garden and turn inwards. And somehow through the care of the total institution, um, uh, they could move out of the state that they had, uh, the extreme state that they had entered with. And that some people regret the asylums, people who've been inside them because they provided that kind of caring institution. They don't, uh, regret the um, the negative side of the asylums, the absolutely horrific kinds of brutality that could also take place and did take place, particularly when they got too large. Um, I think what one of the things I say in the book and one of the bits of research um, that were very that was very very surprising to me when I discovered it is that you know prison populations go up when asylum and care facility populations go down. Um, in other words, the same people may enter the, the, um, the judicial system as could enter the care facilities or the asylums. Um, and it's just a question of how society decides to understand and look after um, these kinds of extreme states. Um, in the late eight, late 19th and early 20th century, of course, we um, witness, um, let's say, in the popular imagination, one of the most uh, well-known asylums is the uh, Salpetriere Hospital in Paris, where Jean-Martin Charcot uh, worked with women, female patients, but also men who were um, uh, diagnosed with what was then at the time called hysteria. And um, from that point, from then on, as the, as the uh, practice of psychoanalysis develops into the early 20th century, there's a shift into also the consultation room and a more privatized uh, relationship between doctor and patient. So in the case of, of course, the Salpetriere, it was quite a spectacle. And then in the case of the consultation room, questions of privacy and different forms of attention come up. One of the things that I was really surprised about in rereading the book, or which struck me quite differently, for example, is this idea that um, patients, certain patients, um, thinking of Augustine, the famous uh, hysteric from the Salpetriere, and also um, Sabina Spielrein, uh, who uh, was a patient of Carl Jung's, they themselves um, entered into professions of care after having been cared for. And I'm interested in this idea that, um, that the patients collude with or collaborate with the doctors or analysts in being cared for, um, that they're contributing to the development of knowledge about um, the mind and that they enter into these uh, professions of caring themselves. Of course, Augustine as a nurse and then uh, Sabina Spielrein as, a, as an analyst. Um, can you say something about that, that transition, you think how that, how that functions or it's still how that was accessible to women to, to go through that transition. So the, the first of the great asylums, which was um, Pinel's um, Salpetriere, if you like, and, and the institution that preceded it, um, were looked after by caretakers. Um, um, and the caretakers often had wives and their wives were regular participants in the looking after of patients. And I think um, in a professional way, although the head was named as male and eventually was also a medical doctor, um, women 
played into the worked within the profession for a long time. So that's that's one thing to say. But the next thing to say is that even now, um, if you're say studying psychoanalysis, you have to go through a trainee analysis. And and one of the reasons for this, I think, is that you know we like to think on one level that we're unless we're artists, but uh, if we're not artists, we like to think that we're deeply rational creatures and um, that these states of mental disarray or emotional excess are not part of our everyday lives. But of course, we also know that they are. We aren't altogether in control of our actions or our speech or our emotions. And, and that there is something other, something subter subterranean, which you could call the unconscious. Uh, call it what you will, it doesn't matter. Freud calls it an unconscious and that's good enough. And so do a lot of the uh, writers. Um, so there is this terrain and, and the people who learn um, about this terrain from their own experience. In other words, people who've been through uh, mental um, disarray or emotional excess are often very good at dealing with patients as well. And um, I think one of the good things about Freud is although, you know, uh, in an earlier book called Freud's Women, uh, which I wrote with John Forrester, it was quite clear that, you know, Freud might have been an old fashioned Victorian patriarch in one respect, but in another respect, he very openly and, and adamantly created a profession into which women could enter. Um, and, and all the therapies are very much, um, well, now I would say in, even in almost larger part run by women or there are more women therapists and more women analysts in many countries than there are men. So, so I, I, you know, I, I think the being a patient, what you call a patient, is somebody who has had an experience of, of these extreme states. The Salpetriere under Charcot is, is a special entity because, of course, you know, the patients there did go to a, through a different kind of training, which was also the training in how to be spectacular. <laughs> in how to perform a particular set of actions, um, which could be seen by Le Tout Paris and, and eventually um, the much wider world as um, the enactments of a particular set of ailments, which Charcot very adamantly as a secular man wanted to separate from the kinds of enactments that you saw in at that moment, say, um, saintly possessions. Uh, and those two were very open to women. <laughs> and uh, these saintly possessions, which were played out in Lourdes on a daily basis and together with the miracles that they performed were something that he wanted to say, look, this is actually hysteria. This is not to do with a godly event. It is not to do with the arrival of a saintly force. It is to do with something that happens when your emotions and mind go astray. And let us call it hysteria because it has physical manifestations and the physical manifestations are everything from um, skin anesthesias to paralysis to blindness um, and so on. Quite extreme manifestations. And of course, you know, Freud's early hysterics had that too. They weren't, they weren't, you know, mild, mildly um, extravagant women, as we know, we now think of them. Um, they were people who were really rather ill, um, often couldn't move properly, had problems with, with various limbs, um, as well as mental uh, difficulties. I'm sorry, I, I've rambled and I'm not sure whether I've answered. No, 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 it's very, uh, it's very interesting and it uh, answers the question. Um, can you talk a little bit then about, so uh, within the, uh, Let's say the the spectacular regime of the of the uh, audit, uh, the amphitheater at the Salpetriere. There's a calling for attention on the part of the patients and also on the part of the analysts. And as you said, the public was invited to come and uh, witness um, uh, the patients. Uh, I don't want to use the word performing in a cynical or or a crude way, but performing their uh, maladies and um, Moving back to the to the under hypnosis, to the, sorry, quite often, quite often under hypnosis. The hypnosis yes. is very important, uh, um, uh, which requires a which is a whole different a whole package when we talk about attention, <laughs> right? Um, so thinking about the way that um, 
that kind of attention, which moved science along in a certain way, um, differs from the attention uh, that's required, let's say, in the psychoanalytic setting. Could you talk a little bit about the way attention operates within the psychoanalytic setting where the analyst and the analyzant, the person being analyzed, is are in um, an attentive uh, dialogue, usually verbally one-sided? Okay, well, um, oh, so many things to say, I don't quite know where to start, <laughs> but Let's say, from the point of view of the patient, what is wanted is the attention of the figure who is either the therapist or the medic or the listener. And psychoanalysis is, we often talk of it as the talking cure, but it's also the listening treatment. And um, the analyst is meant to be a sublime listener, <laughs> um, somebody whose attention floats freely through the analytic session, through the therapeutic session, whatever length it is, and somehow is in touch or grows in touch with what it is that the patient is signaling through their language. And, and I say language because it is done through free association. And free association is an interesting thing. It's not easy, not everybody can do it. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I seem to be free associating here uh, in a way I am, but I'm free associating within, you know, restrictive bounds and there's a lot of self-censorship that goes in. But the point of analysis and therapy, of course, is that uh, you'll move beyond the self-censorship to actually um, reveal to yourself as much as to that free floating attention of the analyst, what it is that's going on within you that's blocking you, that's fixing you in a particular place um, where your attention may indeed only be able to be um, on what it is that you don't want it to be on. <laughs> um, so so uh, Christopher ba uh, Bolas talks about the it's a kind of willing suspension of dis disbelief. If you're literary and you know your Keats, <laughs> the willing suspension of disbelief, in other words, the suspension of the rational mode into something which actually floats freely through the session um, and becomes attuned to the language that's at play within um, the patient and your relationship to the patient is what the analyst is attempting to do. Uh, but, you know, that's only one kind of attention. Winnicott, the great child uh, analyst and probably the most important child analyst in the English language, um, uh, who, uh, a man who was working in England um, before the Second World War and after the Second World War, and was really in many ways responsible for the creation of, if you like, the... the um, the national health settlement on what mothers and children um, should aim for, should look like, what they should receive from the NHS and what they could give to their children. He talked about the, the you know, the mother-child dyad, the couple of the mother and the child. And his kind of attention, he makes attention central to the maternal role. So attention becomes something um, that if the mother isn't very good at giving or um, isn't alert to what the baby's needs are. This is something that perhaps she could be helped with because um, you know the mother who doesn't pay attention doesn't waken the child in all its nerve endings, um, you know, in its moods, um, in what becomes its eventual physical as well as psychological welfare. So that's another kind of attention that comes to us through an analyst, if you like, but is specifically to do with the small child, the infant. And um, he would have said the mother, we could now say the parent. I mean, it doesn't really matter, except, um, um, you know, there's a small question of the breast, but we won't go there. <laughs> um, there is a kind of attentiveness that comes into that. I think, you know, with an analysis, attention goes different ways because the patient too is paying attention to themselves and forgets, one hopes, the presence of the other, except insofar as uh, uh, a kind of um, 
a friendly or holding, Winnicott would have said, a holding environment is created in which certain things can be lived through um, in the um, gentle free-floating attention of the therapist. Is this attention, um, uh, let's say in the Winnicottian uh, sense, a uh, form of attunement rather than a way of reacting to a cry for attention or a call for attention? Is it something that you but, learn a bodily kind of uh, reaction, uh, not reaction, but response that is, yeah, you become more attuned to the- I don't, I don't think Winnicott would have made other. a distinction between you know, the bodily and the mental emotional. I mean, you know, the psyche of course is also a bodily space. Yes. It is not, it is not, um, you know, cut off. It's not, we're not in the Cartesian world here. You know, if, if any Cartesian joke could be made, um, the Freudian one would be uh, Cupido ergo sum, you know, I want, therefore I am, I wish, therefore I am. <laughs> but the body is very much part of that space. And, um, so the baby's call is very important and is, is part of the baby. Um, the mother's language may be important too, although the baby may not understand it in the rational way initially that, that language is understood. Now, you know, there are all kinds of criticisms one could make of this if you want to, but for the moment, if, we, if we're looking at attention, Winnicott is important here too as, as um, if you like, the, the focuser in on attention within the child and carer space. Um, and of course, for him, the, the, um, eventually the main form of communication becomes play. And that's interesting for artists too, because play of course is, is a kind of uh, a proto-artistic enterprise. <laughs> um, uh, or activity. And for him, the, the space of the analyst is uh, taken um, in not only by language, but by actually creating uh, an atmosphere and environment in which play, this, this, this creative, curious uh, potential of the child is awakened and can come into being. Um, a, a person who was, of course, closely related to Winnicott um, is the uh, psychoanalyst and educator, Marion Milner, who we've mentioned to each other in our correspondence. Um, and Milner had a different conception of attention or was one that was also extremely introspective. Um, if just her, her initial book written in 1934, A Life of One's Own is a seven year experiment in living to find out what it is that makes her happy. Um, in a diaristic form. Um, and um, what, she, what she discovered uh, for herself um, was that she, it was almost a kind of parsing of the ways in which she was paying attention to things. Well, Marion Milner is very, very special. And I think she's, she's utterly wonderful. And I recently reread um, 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 the Hands of the Living God, which is her analysis of seven years of a very, very troubled young woman who is, you know, we would say on the psychotic edge rather than the neurotic side of, of, of unwellness. And um, she eventually, it takes a long time, but is able to help her or, or she is helped, Susan, her name is, is helped by the presence of Mary Milner through uh, drawing through mm -hmm. doodling. And I think this is important to Milner. I mean, I think for Milner, and, and here's where we get to, you know, the opposite uh, within words. Um, for Milner, losing oneself, um, and for her, the aim of analysis is to forget oneself, to cease to pay attention to oneself, just as it was, if you like, in the early days of analysis for Pinel. You know, he believed in distraction. You know, if, if you believe that you're, um, I don't know, Napoleon, you know, and a lot of people did believe they were Napoleon at one point because illness expresses itself in the language of the times, uh, psychological illness in, in the language of the times gives it. If you thought you were Napoleon, 
Um, and every time Napoleon was mentioned, terrible things happened to you or you began to rant in a particular way and so on. The point was to distract you from that. And gradually all the areas you were distracted into would work better. So <laughs> uh, the whole of you would work better because more and more of that distraction took place. We can come back to distraction later if you want. Um, for Milner, uh, the aim is to lose oneself, to go into perhaps in a simple way, a kind of trance, but certainly the kind of space that we all occupy when we're trying to make something, um, whether it's the doodle or the drawing, or um, she also talks about finding the right word, which is, which is um, you know, writing. Um, you're doing something outside yourself, but and in the process forgetting yourself, but in that forgetting, the self actually manages somehow to come together and the angry parts of themselves, the self that have been split off, uh, uh, manage to be balanced and no longer split off. Um, they come together. I have a quotation somewhere, uh, which she thinks about as the, um, the aims of analysis, if you like. The patient begin, begins to see her conflicts as paradoxes and her actions as morally equivocal or equivocal. Um, good, because good and bad parts of the self are interanimating rather than split off. So through that act of making, uh, whether it's words or drawings or paintings or you know, people increasingly say music, um, the, these warring aspects of the self, these conflicted split off aspects of, themselves, of the self can begin to work together and are not so inimical to each other as to tear you apart. So that, you know, when one is in, in um, the nasty side, if you like, takes over. I mean, Lacan would have called it a, um, an, um, an obscene superego for example, uh, takes over and is constantly flagellating you and, and saying, no, 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 you can't do this and, and providing punishments. Um, that begins to be slightly distanced and you're able to take in what it's saying, but also see it in relationship to the positive aspects of the self. So that they're not, they, you know, they interanimate each other. Um, um, yeah, and, and we begin to be able to live with paradox. So everybody has good and bad. We all always fail and some, sometimes fail, sometimes succeed. Um, we both love and hate, um, sometimes the same person, <laughs> sometimes ourselves. And these things are not unheard of. Um, it's not a reason for self-flagellation. It's a reason for considering and thinking and processing and working it out. Mm -hmm. This idea, um, Milner's idea that imagination and creation could help uh, one come to live with their paradoxes, isn't an idea that was shared by all artists, right? There are artists who um, feel quite opposite. If you tinker with uh, my psyche, you might mess with my creativity or in let's say the past, uh, my, my male genius. Mm -hmm. And um, you speak about this as well in Mad, Bad and Sad. I think, you know, one of the interesting things about this is that there's nothing that says that if you're going to take on art or writing or indeed the making of, of music, composing as your profession, that you're not then going to be... Um, just as prone to madness or as terrible a person <laughs> or as conflicted as anybody else can be. Um, it, you know, art does not necessarily only um, make you able to cope with yourself or, or indeed, um, it, it certainly doesn't do that. It can exacerbate things. But I think what Milner is talking about, she's not talking about professional artists um, no. or professional writers. She is talking about people who come to her and who need some kind of help. And that help can come, as it can for the professional, I'm not saying it doesn't, but that's not the main aim there. They're not, um, you know, when I write, I'm not setting out to actually uh, do a kind of self-analysis or, or, or put any kind of 
um, you know, the remnants of a traumatic experience uh, to rest, I'm actually setting out to create something. Um, but if you're, you know, to do this when things are bad for you can have that uh, reanimating effect. Okay, it doesn't necessarily if you take it, if you take it on as a profession, all kinds of other things come into play as well. Um, and they're the things we know that if you know if you take up banking, it may be the same. I don't know. I've never done that, <laughs> but but I suspect that is the case. Um, and certainly, as you say, um, you know, artists are not actually always extremely good historically in dealing with things. Some of them have been helped by the work that they do. I mean, Virginia Woolf, I think, is in Mad, Bad, and Sad, isn't she? Do I still remember? Yes, <laughs> and, she is. Uh, Virginia Woolf, of course, suffered many breakdowns and um, uh, spent time in the equivalent of health facilities um, and, and was, you know, a troubled uh, young woman. And on occasion, regularly, when she'd finished a work, uh, a book, would have a, a, a kind of an episode of quasi breakdown. Um, but it was managed through her life and, you know, she lived into her 60th year. Um, and we all talk about her suicide as if that was part of her depression. Well, partly it may have been, but of course it was also due to the fact that she couldn't see beyond war. And I think she had reached quite an age and um, she'd obviously had enough and, you know, that's her choice. Um, she wasn't 20, you know, as she was when she first tried it. And I think writing for her both helped and put her into a state where breakdowns were precipitated. So both happened. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about your own writing in, um, not in terms of as a way of uh, analyzing yourself or trying to resolve contradictions or traumas, but in terms of the kinds of attention that it requires, um, specifically because you've written extraordinarily across so many genres. So from crime fiction to, uh, to nonfiction historical studies of, um, uh, of, uh, of the, the scope of Mad, Bad and Sad. You've written two memoirs, um, one about your, your family history and another one about grief um, due to the recent loss of your, of your husband. Can you talk about the way in which your attention is um, distributed across these different um, genres, if that's a fair question or a sensible question? Well, I'd love to hear more about that. I don't know that the attention is differently distributed. Um, I think you, you just use different parts of yourself. I, I know I, I haven't written fiction for a while, but I did write you know, a, a sizable uh, number of books. Um, at an earlier stage of my life. And, and I think one of the things I would say about that is that I take great pleasure in writing and I don't think I would do it if the pleasure weren't there. Um, so, um, you know, I, I love the sense of being taken over by other lives and um, um, the fact that people, ideas, images, places, come into your mind when you're not looking for them. They're just there and you have to pursue them. And you pursue them when you're taking walks or you're swimming or cooking, sometimes when you're looking after the children <laughs> and, and also when you're writing. Um, the difference with nonfiction is that you need to do, I do quite a lot of research for my fiction because I like research which is for me part of the whole process. Um, for nonfiction, you also have to remember what it is um, that you've discovered in a particular kind of way, which also in, needs footnotes uh, and it needs fact checks. And, and that's, that's a very different process. But I know that maybe to do with, with you know, my strange moving into being a writer. I never thought of myself as a writer particularly. Um, I just somehow stumbled into it in, in almost the kind of way that Marion Milner talks about. It, it wasn't a, you know, a professional end that I had in mind. It just sort of happened. <laughs> and um, 
whenever I've been writing fiction, I've always thought, oh, I actually, I want to do some more um, nonfiction writing and vice versa. <laughs> I want both. Memoir is a strange um, mixture of the two because memoir in a sense is both essayistic and often needs, uh, in my case, when I was doing writing about my parents' war, needs a lot of historical research. Um, but it, because it deals with memory, um, which is of course one of the um, uh, shared spaces that imagination has. Um, I think imagination and memory must be very closely linked both neurally and, and um, in fact, um, I think memoir deals with both. I mean, it, it takes a kind of fictional uh, character uh, in the writing uh, as much as um, an essayistic and fact-checking historical character. Um, writing about grief for me was, was, was slightly different because I think there, there was both an attempt to escape. Um, grief, and, oh, do you want to talk about grief? I don't know that we necessarily need to, but, but it, it's, a, it's, a very, it's one of those states that I think falls into the rubric, both of what For, Freud talks about is melancholy, um, but also, ends up very, very close to some of those madness states that are so often described. And, and I think the reason for this is that you feel, and, and this happens to most people, less perhaps for the death of parents because they tend to happen when, when you're younger and need to get on with things in a different way, but sometimes happens with parents, um, very often happens with the death of friends or partners. Um, there, there's a way in which um, a, a kind of anger is engendered. Um, and I think we find this in COVID days. I mean, it, it's something that uh, probably needs to be talked about more, that the population, which is a population in grief, all of us are in a sense, very angry. We're sometimes angry at one another. Uh, people are often angry at partners, but we're also angry at our governments. And, and you see that all mm -hmm. over the place. I mm -hmm. don't think it's just a British phenomenon, although in Britain, and it's something I wrote about in, in Everyday Madness, it's exacerbated by the facts of Brexit, which actually meant leaving a state, it's all like a death, leaving a state that you had been, the nation had been in, for almost 50 years, 40 years, <laughs> and entering um, a completely separate state where all the ghosts of the past were still there. Um, and, and I think, you know, a lot of the stuff that's been happening in Britain politically is linked to the, this, this grief of at least half of its population, mm -hmm. and indeed more, because I don't think people knew what they were voting for because they were um, you know, taken over by populist politicians quite a lot. But anyhow, that, that's my point of view. Um, but I, I think there is a, a truth about grief in that. Um, and that the state of grief uh, talks in the, book, in, in the book, I talk about the different kind of attention it takes up. And it's the attention you don't want. You want to be rid of that kind of focus and repetitive focus. A little bit like people talk about trauma, although not exactly the same. Right. I mean, that was very um, striking about everyday madness, the, the way in which um, the anger wasn't just the anger that you were feeling um, in relationship to loss, but that it was a collective anger. And it was something that was being played out on the street in interactions in the public, not just in, in the private space of the home. So I've, it was, um, it was, uh, yeah, it was something that uh, was very, um, it was clear that it was a commentary also on the time within which this was happening to you and that there was a shared sense of, of uh, monumental loss that the culture needed to cope with. You know, and as I say, not everybody might, might agree with me on this, but, but there was a kind of, I was attempting a kind of analysis, both of myself, the state of grief and um, what seemed to me to be the larger state of loss that was, uh, taking place. Um, and I think, you know, people can do this, I think now about COVID too, because I think there's a way in which we don't yet know what COVID is going to produce in us. Um, 
I, and I don't mean as only the illness, but you know, when people talk about trauma, it's the post-traumatic that has an effect. The trauma, of course, has an effect too, and you know, the horror of people dying and so on. But what comes out of it is also a, a very difficult state mm -hmm. or sets of states. Um, I think it would be a good time now, it's seven o'clock, to open up to questions. Um, it's nice to see uh, the lounging and the comfort being felt at uh, in 84 Steps. Is there anyone in the live audience? I've checked now the, the Q&A. We welcome questions from the remote audience as well. Is there anyone who has a question for... Uh, Lisa, or I should say, who has a question for Lisa? Janice. But I can't hear you because the Kunst Institute Melly computer is on mute. Hi, good evening. Um, we briefly used the word distraction at one point, and I'd like to. Um, ask something about distraction and attention. Um, towards the end there, you mentioned um, the manipulation of attention sometimes by um, the political state in relation to Brexit, um, the possible manipulation of um, the British people to go in a certain direction. Um, in terms of the attention economy, we're distracted, we're asked to be distracted all the time. That's the problem of the attention economy. And we've been looking a lot about the care of slowing down and giving real loving attention and the importance of that in relation to being psychically well. But could you say something about that other state that we're in all the time in our contemporary world, the ch 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 Instagram yes, state? It's, it's very, very, very difficult. And I think one wants to be able to break it as much as possible. And I know that a lot of my younger friends who are far more um, uh, social media ties, can we say, than I am, um, very often go uh, on holidays from all their um, interconnected states and apps, because this is necessary in order to actually focus in on um, another kind of attention, which might be uh, productive or creative work. Otherwise, you can't because distraction, um, although, as I've said, also has its goods, if there's an etern in internal um, preoccupation that you can shed, an obsessionality that you can shed, this external demand for our attention from our phones and everything else um, is another form of obsessionality and needs also to be broken. Um, and I think probably because it happens, and uh, we haven't talked about this, but I, th I think it's important to talk about, I don't think that um, life in two dimensions is the same as life in three dimensions. And I think it's very, very important to have shared spaces that are physical and bodily too. Um, and I say this now in this really great knowledge that after our various lockdowns, there is a different set of stimulus that comes from live bodies. And I'm not talking here about sex. I'm talking just about ordinary enc encounters, conviviality, people in a room, uh, people, you know, breakfasting or dining together. And um, the amount of stimulation and the kind of stimulation that comes from that is really very different from the kind of stimulus that you get from um, your phone and scrolling and watching uh, two-dimensional figures. And I think, you know, in, in the same way that all kinds of therapists will say to you, if you want to talk to um, an adolescent who refuses to listen to anything, you need not only to um, get them to look at you, to gaze into your eyes and you know, respond with the gaze, but also to hold them in some way, to touch them. You've got to hold your know, shoulder, arm, hand, whatever it happens to be. Um, and that will focus a different kind of relationship and a different kind of attentiveness. So 
one of the things about the attention economy is that it's not very attentive. <laughs> it's very good at distracting, but it's not very good at um, really, if you like, caring for or catering to other kinds of needs. But, but there is a, um, there's an addictive attention with, within it mm -hmm. because that same adolescent that if you touch the shoulder and take away the phone, you might get a completely hysteric reaction. So there's a massive amount of attention to, yes. to the phone. So, so what's, a, what's the difference between caring attention and addiction attention? Well, you know, I, I would call one, uh, whatever's going on is addiction. Addiction is very, very hard to break. And this is why it's possible that these things have an element of danger in them. I don't think it's total danger. I don't, you know, I haven't seen uh, people break down because they're, you know, with their telephones or gadgets and we all do it. But I think there's a, there's a question of a kind of balancing act, um, which is that certain bits of the day need perhaps to be free from this. And um, addiction needs, you know, a couple of jolts. It doesn't need full time. <laughs> um, you know, I say that easily. I know it can be hard, but you know, these holidays are not a bad thing. And I'm not somebody who actually thinks the internet is bad. I'm constantly, you know, either online, um, doing research online or, um, you know, following my friends on Twitter. I'm, you know, I do this a lot and I do see how addictive it can be. It, but then, you know, writing is addictive too, as is painting. So I, I don't want to use the word addiction as if it only has a druggy self-involved, okay? Because that's the normal, um, you know, that's where we go to for our models. If it's addiction, then we think drug addiction. But you can be ad addicted to work as well. <laughs> okay, you need the boat um, that it provides, the... the um, you know, the kick that it provides. So we, we all have forms of addiction. The, 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 uh, the desire would be, or, you know, my desire would be perhaps to somehow, you know, um, look at my phone, but also perhaps be able to bake a cake or, or uh, read a book without looking at my phone so that something else can also have attention. Your partner, your child. I mean, I think one of the, for somebody my age, one of the saddest things to do is to go into a restaurant now that we're finally allowed to do this and to find the, two, the partners both on their phones. I mean, didn't have to leave the house to do that. <laughs> um, so it, it seems a very strange way of, of um, I don't know, being together. It negates the bodily presence. And I know, that's what I would say. Although, you know, I'm not a very punishing person. I'm not very, my children were allowed to use their phones and when one of them had one <laughs> and so on. But, but I think it's a question of having other alternatives too. What do you think? Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, I wonder if you can speak a little bit uh, more about that part when you talked about grief and loss. And the reason why I'm asking this question is because some of us or certain people, let's say um, in my uh, circle, we often find ourselves in a, a griefing the living, right? So we are in a constant stage of grief, right? To the extent that we feel we are griefing the, the living. It's not really about the loss. It's about that is about to come. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about grief. You mean grief for the future, fear? The, the present itself. And grief for the present and, and yes. what the world has become. Yes, like many of us feeling um, um, uh, basically dead. Uh, much more than alive, but we are um, in a in a state of um, it's it's more like an intuition. It's a feeling, you know, that grieving the the, the living much more than the dead. But mm -hmm. yeah, it would be great if you can talk a little bit more, maybe about this relation. Because if I got you correct, sorry, you were talking about the um, 
the connection between grief and the great lost. I think that's that's uh, what you said. So thank you. Um, so you know, I I I understand what you're saying, uh, but I myself would not necessarily use the word grief um, in relationship to one's very um, upsetness and and uh, sense that, that the present and perhaps the future don't hold out any hope. Um, because I, I think it, it's a different kind or it's a different set of emotions perhaps. But you know, you can use words any way you like. I mean, the, the word grief is a very, very, um, it's not like being depressed although it may have an element of depression in it. it. It has an element of attack in it as well. One is taken over and uh, if you like, uh, battered by um, a set of e emotions. And I think depression is uh, of the kind that you, you may be talking about, which is compounded by worry and, and a kind of helplessness um, as to the way in which the world has turned. Um, which is completely genuine and something I feel too, um, is, is, a, is a condition that, or is a state of things that, that can be expressed perhaps much more directly through art and literature than that really, really um, almost implacable and, and um, um, unrelieving um, emotion of grief. So uh, maybe I'm just trying to rescue a word because I know exactly what you're talking about, but I have no solutions to it because I do think the world is pretty bad and, and uh, at the moment. And what I would say to you as, as a historian or in part a historian is that there are moments like this um, very often in history and they do shift or they seem to shift. So in, I, I lived through the seventies as a young person, probably perhaps your age, although I can't see you anymore. So I haven't got a clear sense of how old you are. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, the seventies were a very, very difficult time because we had, um, in fact, I found a whole series of artworks which were about the nuclear bomb um, and were, which grew out of CND, the, the campaign for nuclear disarmament. And I could feel in, in these artworks, I found them in a folder uh, in a top cupboard I could feel that they were linked to a, an overwhelming sense of the urgency of something destructive about to happen, um, uh, as we now feel, and we felt it then too, but not in the, with the same primacy as 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 you know, uh, conflagration and war, um, as we feel uh, the environmental collapse, climate change now. Um, and it was also a time of social unrest, uh, a huge number of strikes, blackouts when we didn't have enough electricity. So we had something called the three day week um, and we only had electricity three days a week. Um, and the, the streets were filled with rubbish because nobody was collecting them. There were rats everywhere. It was really a difficult time. <laughs> um, and, you know, roll on a couple of years and whoo, um, everything shifted. Um, I don't think I felt it as strongly then because I, I was young and I think there's a different te temporality in play um, between the young and the old. And one of the things that may be wrong with our world and maybe this is what COVID is about, although this is a terribly perverse thing to say, is that there will be a leveling out of the generations somewhat because uh, certainly in Britain, it's, you know, very many more old people have died as a result of this. And, and um, um, there's a sense in which the younger generation, although things are, are difficult, really difficult now, uh, there may be um, a kind of shift in the not too distant. So I say this as a, as a historian, I'd like to offer some degree of hope, but, you know, I know things are really, really hard. Um, and, you know, Although therapy and analysis can help, I, in some ways, if you really need a listening ear, I think probably the doing, in, particularly the doing in groups, as well as the doing alone through art, is, is extremely um, generative. 
Is there another question from the room or should I segue into something that's I've been prompted by your comments? Oh. Go for it, Vivian. So um, thinking about um, uh, care, going back to care, uh, Lisa, in the end of uh, Mad, Bad and Sad, you say that our times may need cures that are broader and other than those can be, that can be found in therapy alone, whether of the talking or the pharmaceutical kind. And because care has become at this stage such a visibly integral part of missions of cultural and educational institutions, such as Kunst Institute Melli, over the past several years. And this notion of care is often linked to social justice uh, efforts or um, uh, movements to repair. Um, uh, care has been raised up into the discourse in the wake of Black Lives Matter, um, the attention to essential frontline workers, the, the, the populations who have been uh, most affected by, by the pandemic. Um, could such a widespread attention to care um, be part of that cure that, um, that our times need that you refer to? Well, I would hope so. <laughs> and I think it, it, perhaps it's happening. I mean, you know, in Britain, um, it's not happening very fast and um, it's not happening in the way that we would most like. But yes, I think part an attention to care would be important, but I think we care for each other as well. I mean, you know, to be slightly Pollyanna-ish, in other words, to see the bright side and the hopeful side, I think one of the things that came out of our lockdowns, and I think this may be the same in um, other countries as well, is that people started to pay uh, more caring attention to their neighbors and the well-being of the people around them. Um, I don't know how long that goes on for in busy cities where people are trying to, you know, make their lives. Um, but, but there was a sense that, that there was more care. And I think, you know, group endeavors, I think, are very, very important within this. So it's wonderful to see you in a room, obviously engaged in a shared project. But, you know, I found when I was writing Mad, Bad and Sad, that even for depression, which is um, too often medicalized, I think. Uh, one, of the, one of the tenets of that book and the long history was that we've entered an age of super medicalization for all kinds of, of ills, which um, some of which are more on the side of suffering or what people have as, you know, there's a whole kind of spectrum of what we are as human beings. Um, the doctors cannot cure <laughs> um, the doctors, maybe in their bodies, they can cure. If you go to a doctor and it's a, you know, the, she's a good doctor, then the very fact of having that attention will make you better. But the, the pill that they give you may act as well if it's a placebo as if it's a drug. So, so what I'm really saying is that, or what I wanted to say was that other kinds of activity can take that place too. So people, people who are depressed very often doing, um, you know, group running or even group walking, um, but something which has a regularity and a component of others within it is as effective as taking a drug and staying alone in your room. Um, going for, you know, a two hour walk um, once a week or two one hours in a week um, and regular doing that regularly will be as effective in shifting depression as um, drugs and so on. I mean, I'm not saying this is a cure for all, um, all conditions, but you know, it certainly works for that kind of uh, depression that, that so often uh, certainly the young are prone to. Mm. Yeah, that's a, I guess that could also be um, ca categorized in the, in the realm of self-care, which is something that we're more and more um, asked to, to do, to take care of ourselves in, uh, as the distribution of the resources and infrastructure for care, the institutional distribution, healthcare um, uh, resources, uh, financial resources, 
um, has shifted the responsibilities away from certain uh, governmental agencies or state agencies toward, toward the individual and the collective, which is now required in the absence of those um, safeguards to start caring for each other and caring for oneself. So it's, it's quite paradoxical because um, um, being asked to care, I can give an example from, from my own context of uh, education, working at the Willem de Koning Academy, for example, um, we have now over the past year and a half been um, offered um, to be able to work with vitality coaches. So that was something that was offered to us online. Um, we could do exercises, we could, um, we could do meditation sessions with the vitality coaches, we could have students and staff, we could have, um, we could have uh, 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 conversations with vitality coaches, not therapy, but a kind of airing of grievances or concerns. And um, so that's on the one hand, we're offered this beautiful package of vitality coaches, which will help us to come to our jobs and do them um, in, in a way that is effective and also beneficial to our students. Um, and our students can continue to learn from us. Um, on the other hand, I was struck last week by the fact that one of the members of the executive board of, of my university, the Rotterdam University of Applied Sciences, um, responded to what is a rampant housing crisis in the Netherlands and particularly in Rotterdam and particularly for international students with the advice that teachers should um, bring students into their homes and give them any extra rooms that they have in order to help solve this housing crisis, which um, you know not only brings up a whole host of ethical and moral and uh, uh, conflict of interest issues, but it's also a very strange way for um, an institution to, on the one hand, offer services that are meant to make you well, and on the other hand, to say, well, in addition to offering you those as a as a kind of um, uh, not a payback, but as in, 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 in an act of reciprocity, maybe you could help solve our uh, housing crisis by adopting some students. So I find that to be a, a really uh, sort of example of this paradox that just sort of popped up in, 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 in my own working context very recently. A difficult situation. So, yeah, so what, how, how much do we care? I mean, how much are we supposed to care? Are we supposed to care so much that we start bringing our students into our homes? Um, you know, and also, uh, let's say, um, not to mention uh, what that means for the educational sort of trajectory of a, of a student's life, but also what it means for, for the student's privacy, for, for, the, for the teacher's privacy, and so on and so forth. So where, what are the limits to this care that can be expected of us in our, uh, in I don't our think, roles? I don't think that's care. <laughs> yeah. I, I, think, I think that's institutional coercion myself, uh, both for the students <laughs> and for the uh, don the 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 instructors the professors um, I think there's a way in which um, the institutions in our society sometimes take advantage of the people who work within them um, and I don't uh, you know it, it could be you could do it for a week but it's no solution to anything um, no no and I raise it just as a paradox and not for sympathy either but to say that you know what is the responsibility of cultural institutions for example to care now for the publics um, um, when they are when they themselves are having to also um, cope with let's say diminishing budgets or um, um, uh, internal conflicts or, or what have you. So the burden of responsibility is being shifted to the cultural sphere or the educational sphere in a way that I think um, will continue to, 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 uh, to develop. Um, and I'm concerned about how we can continue to respond attentively and creatively to those conditions. I have no answer for you because it would, no. it would take a huge uh, critique and an in-depth critique of, of the structures of our universities and indeed the way in which the old welfare state has broken down yeah. many of its aspects. And that's to do with a particular kind of financialization uh -huh. that has come in place since the, oh boy, let's say since the nineties, although perhaps even before, um, and that's beyond my, uh, you know, I can, I can comment. No, of course. My area of ex expertise. Yeah. And I don't think we can, you know, I don't think we want to overdo 
that word care. I mean, I used it for that vocabulary of the future because I do think it's an area that needs to be highlighted. But, uh, um, you know, in a way we're moving if we overuse it and it's something that we've kept to one side of this discussion, we move into the old Christian theological issues. Because of course, you know, although care is not um, etymologically related to caritas, part of the, the, the burden of churches or the, the um, uh, institutional, you know, um, I don't know, grid <laughs> the church has worked within was the care for the homeless, the, the less well off and so on uh, within a structure of virtue of which uh, care is one. And, uh, you know, maybe we need a version of the churches to come into play again properly. Vivian, you get the last <laughs> word. At that point, I'm um, just desperate to jump in exactly at that theological juncture with uh, two questions. Uh, we're very short in time, so maybe even they could be responded to in terms of further references, because uh, they're questions that I ask with further iterations of our programs and with further threads of research that we're exploring through this exhibition in mind. So the first is indeed that you diagrammed in your talk the way that the modern clinical model emerges uh, with the abrogation of a theological model of, of possession or even of sort of demonology. Um, and I'm very interested in that juncture and what it means to unpick that. Uh, and, you know, the obvious question is what happened to the demons? What happened to the angels? You know, did, did they truly go away? And you sort of suggest perhaps that's not the case. So that's one, I won't even call it a question, I'll call it a node of inquiry that we're interested in. Uh, and another one is in terms of um, the bodily component. You said that the psyche is a bodily space or is conceived of as a bodily space within okay. psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have with us uh, tonight some, some artists who have picked away at a certain moment in the Dutch tradition of, of therapy, uh, in which as part of a radical anti-psychiatric movement, a model of snoozel realm or physically stimulating, sensorially stimulating space was developed um, as, as a part of uh, psychiatric treatment that didn't rely on the talking cure. Uh, and I was interested if there is, I don't know, a, a working definition of what the sensorium is or of how the sensorium functions within um, either the condition of breakdown or the therapeutic paradigm. So sort of two nodes of inquiry that I'd love response to, given that we have uh, your presence with us. I don't know if I can do this quickly. But... <laughs> <laughs> um... So I won't try the first one because I think it's, it's a big question and, and you know, a lot has been written about it. And it is true that in every culture, um, certainly within Europe and indeed in, in, um, in Africa and Latin America, um, religion and possession, demonology and um, the secularization that took place with the enlightenment, um, and the growth of the doctors into that area has, has happened. And it's, you know, they still come together at various points or, or tear apart. So, you know, it's a, it's a very tricky one. Um, I'm not very good at the languages of religion um, because I think they, they, um, they can obfuscate, but I can also see where they are extremely useful to people in terms of being able to lead some kind of good enough life. Um, so that's that's one thing. The sensorium. Well, you know, the, the sensorium question is huge because, of course, we are in our bodies and it is quite clear that, you know, partly depending on your your um, childhood and the way in which you progress through it, uh, partly depending on your genetic makeup, um, your relationship to your senses is slightly, each one of us is, is you know, has a, has a different makeup. And that plays into the way in which we see the world, we smell it, um, and we find a space within it. You know, I, I may need, um, I'd be more comfortable outside for some reason than I am inside, and I don't know why. 
Um, but th that's part of my sensorium. Uh, is this the kind of thing you mean? Is this what you're talking about? Okay, um, sorry, I'm looking around the corner as if I could see you around the corner, but it's <laughs> you're not around the corner. <laughs> that's part of our sensorium now. I mean, I think the whole digital sphere and what it does to us. And of course that was preceded slightly different um, in, in terms of the way it plays upon you by film and television um, and the taking over of image culture, um, which is now very uh, ocular culture, which is so important to us. Um, and it's always been very interesting to me that at the beginning of the 20th century, you have this alternative uh, tradition put into the being, which is uh, the oral ear tradition, the listening, and speaking tradition that, that Freud and eventually all the other uh, therapists and analysts take in, which is opposed to the eye and the seeing. Um, and if you like, the eye is relegated to the, to the clinic and the, the, you know, this um, oversight, uh, surveillance, all of that is to do with eye culture. So I think, you know, for anybody who's working in the arts, this whole area of the senses becomes increasingly important. Um, we now know, of course, that the nose is a very important, plays a very important part of this, although it's been uh, downplayed in the West and in our movement away from being animals. If you take the Darwinian um, um, paradigm, for real, <laughs> um, but but it's still there, and and it's important in setting up what we taste, um, and the sensorium, of course, works throughout our bodies, so that um, you know all of it is sensual, sexual. <laughs> um, it, it's not just one part: um, the eyes, the ears, the nose, um, um, all come into our um, our repertoire of desire, if you like. Um, and that's important too. Um, um, I, I, you know, there's so much to talk about. I don't even know where to begin. If I had a, a work of art in front of me <laughs> or a poem or something that we, we could talk more, but all of these things are crucial um, to both how we are in ourselves and how we are in the world and how we represent it in, in the various um, artistic forms. Um, Vivian, with that, I think we perhaps have reached time. Yes. Okay. So uh, I will say maybe a concluding word of thanks. Uh, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. And thank thanks to me. our. And thank you to Vivian um, for, for leading this conversation in the most wonderful possible way. Oh, thank you, Lisa. And thank you to Edwin, Angelica, Michelle, and Vinod who have been um, attending. Um, from, I see them in my little panel on the side. Great. So and, thank you um, to you and all of the other remote people. Yeah, and we have uh, Lean with us this evening who we thank for her technical uh, expertise and- uh, Lean, thank you, Lean. Thank you all. And Yeroon who also helped us and the KBK masters and mistress. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. We would all like to just give you a little Thank you. So take care, everyone. Yes, yes. Uh, or don't take it, <laughs> <Yeah>. live it. <laughs> live care, exactly. <laughs> Bye. Thank you Bye. so much. All best. Bye, Lisa. Bye, thank you so much, Vivian. Thank Hope you. it all goes really well. Yes, thank you. It's been a really lovely evening. Bye. Good night. So. Thank you, everybody. It's holiday next week. Sorry. <laughs> 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 I'm gonna put my shoes on and grab a t-shirt. Yes, I think we have got a newsletter yesterday with the opening times. I think the workshop is a little bit of a detail on the
I was really impressed by how well um, it worked with remote guests in this room. Yeah, and downstairs it's, it would have been disaster, but here it's uh, super fun. It's a new day. I'm surprised how well. Oh, there's a loose lens. Oh, ew. Yeah, that's a hard And there's also a. Um, there's a. Oh, I should take my shoes off. There's also a, a neck that looks like a blue. Thank you. 